students, welcome to Year 11 Earth Environmental Science. This is Module 1 on Earth's Resources and we're looking at video number 2 uh, and the structure of the Earth. Specifically, we're going to see what information we've gained about the structure of the Earth through the study of seismic waves. As we've talked about before, what we want to try and do is give you a nice upfront view of what it is that you are trying to do, or at least what I'm trying to do through these videos, which is to give you the opportunity to investigate the structure of the Earth using technologies, including seismic wave velocities. So that's what we're going to be focusing on in this video. Basically, to separate this into three key uh, levels, if if you like, as long as you can initially identify and describe the different types of seismic waves, that's a good start. To be able to discuss how the velocity or the speed of those waves changes as they pass from one medium into another gives you a deeper understanding of what's actually going on here with waves. And of course, what we want to ideally be able to do is to link um, what we know about seismic waves to the understanding that we have of the internal structure of the Earth. So let's have a look. So obviously the first important question is, how do we know what's under the crust? Well, we have tried drilling. Uh, drilling down into the crust is one of the things that we've tried to do, and depending on in which resource you read, uh, about 12.3 kilometres is the maximum that we've got. And when you think about the thousands of kilometres of uh, radius of the Earth that we have, that's not very far. So this is actually not a particularly good way. It has given us some information um, about the crust, but it hasn't given us a great deal of information about what's actually going on in the deeper layers of the Earth. So we can't voyage to the centre of the Earth. That's good for science fiction, not much good for science fact. So what else can we do? Well, we do know that igneous magmas occasionally bring xenoliths. So xenoliths are... Uh, xeno is foreign, basically, and lith is rock. So foreign rock, basically, foreign rock for the crust is from the mantle. So anything that's coming up from depth that may be dragged with a magma uh, or slid through a, a vent may be something that can give us a little bit of information about the composition of uh, the mantle. Occasionally we find these. Uh, obviously, as I'm sure you can appreciate, the temperatures associated with most magma is enough to uh, melt most minerals, uh, most crystals. So this isn't uh, a common occurrence, but it certainly does occur. And where it does, it gives us some nice information about what's actually going on at the uh, level of the mantle. And that's still a couple of layers away from the very center of the Earth. So what else can we use? Well, we can use seismic waves. And seismic waves are really the subject of this particular video. They're the one that we're going to be looking at in a little bit more detail, partly because being waves, they can change their speed as they pass from one medium, medium one, barrier, medium two. Now, interestingly enough, when we look at um, seismic waves, we find we have the two main types of uh, waves represented, compression waves and transverse waves. And these travel differently and they behave differently as they reach different types of uh, barriers or as they cross from one medium into another. So we can find changes in their speed or velocity and accompanying that often we find things like refraction. We may even find reflection if they are bouncing off barriers and not actually passing through and we may even find them um, diffracting around uh, a particular a barrier or an obstacle usually is what we talk about with diffraction. So this sort of behaviour of waves, and we do need to, to understand a little bit of the um, nature of waves in order to do this, but that gives us something to work with in terms of the internal structure of the Earth. The other important thing, of course, is gravitational sorting. Um, we know that uh, gravity is based on, is a force that's based on mass. And we did talk in the last video very briefly about things like the planetesimal accretion theory. We do know that the most, as the um, 
as anything is cooling, um, we're going to have things dropping to the bottom that have the highest mass. Um, and this for us is things like iron. So we know that the core is um, dominated by iron and that's primarily because iron is such a heavy um, element and it has dropped through into the center of the earth as the, as the earth was um, settling in terms of its uh, initial uh, development. So this is what we need to do, is we need to sort of think about what are the different places that we were getting information about the structure of the Earth, and of course um, the iron core is also something that um, is linked to the Earth's magnetism, um, which is another way we can conclude that there must be some iron or at least ferromagnetic materials in that, uh, in that core. So what is it about seismic waves that gives us a little bit of information about the centre of the Earth? Well, let's have a look. So seismology is the study of earthquake waves, and um, we will go into earthquakes in a lot more detail in this particular subject, but we won't look at them for, uh, in too much detail now. We did mention them a little bit in your junior courses, uh, probably in about year 9 or year 10 you would have talked about uh, earthquake waves, and the fact that there are different types of waves. And these waves move differently as they move through different media. And, um, and it's their behavior that gives us a little bit of information uh, simply about the uh, focus or the epicenter of an earthquake, but also some information about this, the structure, the internal structure of the earth as well. So what we want to do is we want to look at the fact that there are two main types of, of earthquake waves that we um, are interested in. And these are body waves and surface waves. Now, the surface waves we're not going to worry too much about in our discussion because they're the ones that do most of the shaking and create most of the problems um, at the surface uh, when earthquakes hit. What we're more interested in are the body waves. And the body waves um, can travel through the Earth's inner layers, but they don't travel uh, the same, and also they don't all travel through um, solids and liquids. And it's the, it's the change in the nature of the internal structure of the Earth and the behaviour of the waves as they reach each of these boundaries that tells us a little bit more about the internal surface. So whilst we know that both body and surface waves will radiate energy, they, that's what waves are, they're carriers of energy, and they can do that across the surface or into the internal structure of the Earth. We can study those to get a bit of an idea about what's actually going on under the crust. So the first type that we need to look at are these P waves or these primary waves. And they're the fastest. So they're the quickest ones that travel once an earthquake begins. You get these radiating P waves that move away. So uh, the epicenter is the point on the Earth's surface above the focus. So you, you have a focus which is, if you like, the point where the earthquake originates on the surface. So on the surface, you have the epicenter. And seismic stations will use something like triangulation, which is to give themselves a little bit of an idea about the um, distance uh, between the time between the P waves and the S waves. Not a very good circle, that one. Um, and you can see that if we have two locations uh, with two radii, which is the, um, the distance that's worked out of how far away the uh, epicenter would be, two's not quite enough unless those two circles um, only overlap in one place. You need a third um, station in order to give you a third uh, circle and eliminate that other one as being uh, not correct. So this is the process of triangulation. It's used uh, by different seismic stations in different locations around the world. And that tells us something about the epicenter and therefore the focus down uh, under the surface of where that earthquakes originated. But you can see in the diagram here that P waves aren't uh, information that we just get hitting the surface. They're also traveling through the internal structure of the earth. And most important, as they reach various barriers, different things happen to them. And these different things that are happening to them actually create some quite interesting little patterns um, that helps to tell us something about what's happening internally. What we do know is that P waves can move through solid rock but they can also move through fluids. So 
uh, that's basically material that's capable of flowing. So obviously gases are a fluid, liquids are a fluid, um, and liquids remain a fluid until they get so viscous that they virtually don't move at all. You need to have flow in order for you to have a fluid. So P waves can travel through all of these. And the P waves are compression waves. So they're waves um, that vibrate in the same direction. So backwards and forwards, uh, like sound. We tend to describe these in terms of compressions and rarefactions, where the waves come close together and then they push further apart. So um, sound is a good example of a compression wave. Now, one of the one of the reasons that we have some interesting information is this little, sh what we call a shadow zone. A shadow zone that uh, is happening obviously on both sides. And this is where we get the P waves moving from the sort of semi-liquid um, lower mantle into the liquid outer core. And you can see that there is some diffraction that's occurring. There's actually some bending around uh, those barriers and also some refraction that's occurring as the wave is um, changing its speed as it goes through to the liquid. Um, and this also happens in the Earth's uh, inner core as well. So this, um, th this compression wave does sort of some pushing and pulling of the rock as it, as it goes. If you think about the way that a sound wave moves, that, that compression and rarefaction, the particles getting close together and further apart, that sort of thing happening, but instead it's happening through the rock, uh, and that's how the wave propagates. That's how it moves. So looking at these shadow zones and working out where they are, and obviously these would be seismic stations anywhere in these sort of regions, would not be picking up the P waves from this particular earthquake at all. And so earthquakes don't all occur in the same place. So as earthquakes have been occurring consistently around the Earth over time, we've been able to build up more and more information and a bigger, bigger picture of what's actually going on internally. But P waves aren't the only important wave, seismic waves that we can use. We can also use S waves or secondary waves. Now, the S waves are slower. Um, they do move through the internal surface of the Earth, but they are slower. The problem with S waves is they can move through solid rock, but they don't pass through fluids. And you can see that the shadow zone here is much greater than it was for the P waves because they can't get through the core. Once they hit that liquid core, um, they can't move through that. So you get a much bigger shadow zone associated with the um, secondary waves or the S waves than what we do with the primary waves. The secondary waves are transverse waves. Now transverse waves um, vibrate at uh, perpendicular or right angles to the direction of propagation. So if this is the direction of propagation, then our particles are going to be, be vibrating at right angles to that. So we tend now, instead of compression and rarefaction, to talk about um, uh, crests and troughs. So this is, uh, this is like light, or it's also like uh, going to the beach. So when you're at the beach, the wave moves towards the sand, towards the shore, but you bob up and down. So you're going at right angles to the direction of the wave. And uh, these different types, so this sort of rocking up and down side to side motion is the way that the S wave pattern is transmitted. Being a little slower, we can, be cons we can get an idea of the difference in time between when an S wave and a P wave arrives at a particular um, seismic station. And obviously, if that difference is bigger, then the slower moving S wave um, is taking longer to get there because there's a greater distance. So the bigger the difference in time between uh, when the S waves arrive, uh, when the P waves arrive, and when the S waves arrive, gives you an idea of how far away the seismic station uh, is from the focus or epicenter of the earthquake. And again, as I mentioned, we use triangulation to do that. But we've also used this to get a sense with these shadow zones of um, what's actually happening, where these barriers are occurring, and not just for one site for earthquakes that happen in all different locations around the earth. So over time, we've been able to 
to do a lot of really effective mapping to get an idea of what's happening in the internal surface, uh, in the internal structure of the Earth. So here's a little bit of Australian data. Um, the important thing to take away, I guess, from our, our quick overview of seismic waves, and we'll look at these in a little bit more detail in class, is that they rely on some of the important properties of waves, reflection, refraction, and diffraction. There are changes in velocity when the waves move from one medium, from M1 to M2. There is a change. Sometimes they will speed up. Sometimes they will slow down. Either way, it usually means that the waves will be refracted and bent off their line. It's helped us to understand that there are different types of uh, crust, oceanic and continental, and there's actually a difference in the density between these two. Um, there's also a difference in density between the uh, upper mantle, the lithosphere and the asthenosphere, and the lower mantle. We also know that the lithosphere consists of the crust and the upper part, very upper part of the mantle, uh, which is solid, and that's where our uh, ideas around plate tectonics are based on. Uh, we know from the shadow zones, we've got an idea of where that liquid outer core is, and also that very high density solid inner core. And the data that you can see uh, in this little diagram, we'll have a look at in class in a bit more detail, but it's showing you that there are um, consistent changes in terms of the speed of waves as we um, go down in depth. And you can also see um, that the marker points for where the boundaries are are not um, horizontal, they're not equal that we have different depths of crust sitting in different locations uh, and with more or less crust under the surface that is uh, going to create a, a larger or smaller space between where those uh, waves are travelling at a certain velocity through one type of crust and where they cross that boundary into the mantle. Lots of information here and certainly something that we'll go through in a little bit more detail in class. Thanks for watching.